everybody. Nedra Russ here, Harmonica Lady. I've got a treat for you today. I was sent a book by Paul Berry, The William Clark Story, Blowing Like Hell. And I've got him here talking about the book and sharing some of the stories and how it was written. And I read it. It's a fabulous book. So all the information is going to be here. He sent a few tracks, um, some of his own. He's quite an amazing player himself. And um, we're going to get right into it right now. Hey, everybody. Nedra the Harmonica Lady here. And today I'm interviewing Paul Barry about himself, his work, and his book about the great late William Clark story. How you doing today, Paul? I'm doing great, Nedra. Thanks for having me on the show today. Appreciate that. Oh, you bet. I um, You sent me your, a copy of your book, and I have to tell you, I enjoyed it very, very much. And so well, did my you. husband. Oh, <laughs> we, great. <laughs> we read it together, and because uh, he's a musician as well, and his family, and so there was a lot that I think someone that's been on the road and is a musician could really relate to. And you put it in a way that is touching, understandable, relatable, and you start to feel like you really knew him. You did a fantastic job. Oh, well, thanks, Nedra. I appreciate that. So tell us about yourself and how you started um, and how you met William and what brought you to do the book. Oh, sure. So I I, I started playing harmonica when I was about 18 years old, just uh Heard it on heard it on the radio, you know, different sources, and just really fell in love with it. And started playing in a band in my early twenties, and had the good fortune to open up for um, William Clark when he was at the Blue Saloon in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I'm from. In 1983, he happened to be on tour with George Harmonica Smith at that time. So, it was, for a young harp player like myself, it was a, a dream come true seeing seeing both of those uh, players in person like that. And it was just, uh, and uh, um, w- William, well, I'll call him Bill because uh, friend, friends kind of refer to William Clark as Bill Clark. So that's how I, I just call him. But Bill and I became really good friends after that weekend. And um, I had the pleasure of living with him in Los Angeles in 1985. And uh, we just, we were friends throughout his lifetime. And, Um, I just became good friends with him and his family, um, Willie and Gina and his wife, Jeanette, who's a great person. And over the years, um, before Bill died in 1986, he and I were working on a harmonic instruction book. And uh, we we never finished it due to his passing. And I thought I would pick it up a few years back. And I started to work on that a little bit. And I thought, I'd be much more interesting to write a biography on Bill because a lot of people really admire the man and his music, but really don't know a lot about his backstory. And um, so that, that, that kind of led me to, to write the biography on Bill. That's fantastic. You know, um, I see behind you on the wall there, you have little Walter and there's not there. How great. And, and Bill and, and a lot of posters like myself here. In right. The studio. Um, but we read the book about little Walter and there was just not enough information to feed what you wanted to know. But your book does give you a good taste of the life of the man. And I think you did an outstanding job. You made it personal. You made it relatable. Um, and I, and we read books like we, uh, like this Julio and I, especially if we're traveling to a show or something, we'll read as we're going and we're driving and we, you know, we'll read about Mark Hummel and, and um, we'll, we'll just, people that we admire, we like to read and find out about. And I like yourself. I knew not, I didn't know about William other than knowing he's a great player. So you brought it into what it's like to the struggle and the life and the dedication that it took to play like he does. And um, I think you do him well also in your playing, because I listened last night to a lot of your music and it's Oh. outstanding and you've you've matri- mastered the technique of playing oh. great blues as well, well. Th- thanks so much nedra um when i started doing bill's biography i i basically had to go back to the beginning of his life so i had to dig back and i i didn't really know a lot about his early years outside he had told me some things like he lived in a trailer park and things like that so 
I had to recreate his whole story from the beginning. And I found out a lot of things about, about Bill. And I knew he was always a hard worker, but I didn't understand about the struggles he had throughout his life, um, his early life and all the struggles with um, alcohol that besieged him. And uh, uh, so I, I found it to be a fascinating story and he overcame a lot of obstacles to be the type of great player he was, but it was, it was really a learning experience for me writing that book. And I'm so glad I did it because I think Bill, Bill deserved um, for his story to be told just because of the, the level he took the harmonica to and the way he moved it forward. He really did. I um I um I started I started studying blues harmonica in nineteen ninety-nine, which is I'm I'm older, I'm your guys' age, but <clears throat> I did not I played harmonica as with bands around just as kind of a hobby. I didn't take it too serious. I was working other jobs. So when I started studying, I had the fortune to go to David Barrett's master classes down in San Jose. And um it was harder for like like you're saying, back in the day, Bill had mentors that he was lucky to do, and he sought them out. And if, if when you guys read the book out there, I'm not going to give everything away because I want you to read it. And um, this is to get you all curious because it, it's it's phenomenal. And the old way you had to learn compared to now. I mean, we have the Internet, like you say in the book, he he really had to go get his chops from the masters and he really had to dig in. He tried some other instruments. I think everybody out there can relate. I know, I know the people that I do podcasts and the students and the people out there will say, well, I tried the bass and I tried the drums and I, and then I mm -hmm. finally found this harmonica and, you right. know, and a lot of people didn't take it seriously and it had different levels of evolution, which is amazing. Cause I, I study all that, like a, a geek now, you know, I'm all out reading things on that. And, David Barrett had um, was were, was bringing in the big masters and you'd go down to San Jose and and you'd get to sit in the classes and the seminars and they'd all tell their their stories. And it evolved into it evolved into day classes as it went with David before he stopped doing it. So I felt super fortunate to be able to go down there and meet and listen and talk and talk personally. And then I found that to be um, a great a great part of my life to be able to go to the conventions and to actually talk to people like yourself and do the podcast and learn and grow myself. But back in the day, you didn't have the internet. And so how would you learn? I mean, you had to, to travel. I, I, like Charlie Busselite went um, into Chicago and uh, right. his stories are fun. You know, he was yeah. driving the old exterminator truck. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he dug in. I know Annie Rhines did. She just she went there. And if you weren't that dedicated and um, you're out playing in the corner, blowing your harmonica, you haven't a clue on what it's what it can do. You know, right. And, yeah. And then I think that he, he just had the soul and um, the spirit to be innovative and to write music. And what a voice. Right. And, he was a triple threat. <laughs> yeah, he 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 was for sure, Nedra. And this talk about the learning experience, I think you're absolutely right. I I learned back in those days, and it's basically just putting the record, you know, the on the turntable and putting the needle back and forth and back and forth, and you you're trying to learn and you're hoping you're in the right key and hoping it sounds right. And it's it was a lot different experience back there, and and uh, so much for the fact that Bill picked up the harmonica upside down and started playing it upside down, just not seeing the little numbers on the top of the harmonica. So that's, so, you know, he took it from, from the very beginning and learned basically on his own. Like you said, he sought out the masters, but he just was just such a hard worker. He just decided when he was 16 years old, that I wanted to be a bluesman. And that was just uh, a major focus for him. And he did it, you know, whatever it took, he, he was, you know, practicing in the bathroom at all hours of the day and going down to the clubs in South Central. And he did it, whatever it took. But you're right. Back then, it was uh, it was uh, took a lot of determination and, and perseverance to uh, to master the harmonica like he did. I, You know, and I think it I think personally, it still does. It takes complete dedication and hard work. I think I, I've run into a lot of people that say, well, it's easy. Yeah. Well, maybe they make it look easy, but it right. really isn't. Here, try it. You know, and they'll play. And go, well, I don't. Oh, know. Ab absolutely. Yeah, I, I marvel at how good how good players are now, and I think anybody, my 
my hats off to them because it, it's a if you think about it, it's the only instrument that you can't see what the player is doing. So it's it's uh, it's uh, anybody that can master it or, or sound good on it has my respect for sure. Oh, for sure. OK, I'm going to get into um, some of William's um, music here. I've got Lonesome Bedroom Blues so you can get a taste of how amazing, amazing a player he was. <laughs>
Oh, yeah. And now, tribute to William Clark by Paul Berry. Enjoy.
the other thing that I found so interesting about the book was the scene down in LA. I had no idea, you know, and I, I'd drive into LA to go to Disneyland or, and things like that as a kid. And then my husband drove truck and we went into LA at work and we're in the, the streets and stuff. But I, I had no idea of the live uh, blues scene that was going there that he was involved with. That's really amazing um, and interesting stuff because I I live close to Sacramento. So, and like I said, we've got David Barrett and we've got Rick Estrin. And I always have said there's a sound, there's a West Coast sound, and you pretty much, uh, you captivate that, you you put that in the book to where there is definitely the West Coast blues sound. It's different than the East or the Chicago. There's something a little bit different about it. Uh, yeah, the, the sure is that, and I, I think that one of the, one of the um, things that came through in my book, which I'm really happy about, is, is that a lot of people... Are, are kind of now uh, more aware of how great that that West Coast, you know, Southern California sound was back then. I think a lot of people always gravitate towards the Chicago sound, but the West Coast had a vibrant, very vibrant scene. You, know, you had Rod Piaz out there, Kim Wilson started out there, of course, William Clark, um, Al Blake, the Hollywood Fats Band, James Harmon. So you had a really vibrant scene with the younger guys. And then you had the only established musicians you know, everybody going back from T-Bone Walker to George Harmonica Smith, um, Philip Walker, Smokey Wilson, Shaky Jakes, all those guys were out there, the originators in South Central, kind of as the base for those guys to learn from. So it, it was a, a fantastic scene out there. And I'm glad my book brought a little more light to how great that scene was Definitely. Uh, at that time. Definitely. And, you know, I know that like um, a lot of people came down to the scene in San Francisco. So you had Paul Butterfield and oh, right. that scene there, you know, um, and I know, I know that scene well, because um, I'm good friends with a lot of people that worked um, the Bill Graham programs to, to um, one of my best friends is her uncle's Nick Gravinatis. And I've gotten to go down and meet Quicksilver and, and be in that scene here in Northern California and then Sacramento and San Jose, we've got uh, David Barrett, of course, and Gary Smith, and then we've got Rick Estrin, and now Kyle Rollins is making the name for himself out right. of Sacramento. So there's yeah. there's some good blues still going. Yeah, exactly. And, and Northern California, like you said, had had a great scene with Gary Smith and Mark Hummel and Rick Estrin. So I think the the California West Coast scene um, really didn't get the respect or maybe the recognition that it really deserved, but there, there was some, just some fantastic players that, that came out of California. And then you had some of the Chicago guys that relocated there, like Luther Tucker and, you know, muscle white ended up there. So um, a lot, a lot of, a lot of great blues happened out in California at that time. You know, there really is. And, and Charlie, he's, um, he's even in our area, he got involved with these, this, these the spiker he had a radio and a band and um he did a few movies that charlie was in and uh they were filmed right here you know oh. miles from me by a friend of mine uh that uh, was involved with all of the sound um his name's hank and he hank brashoff and he did all the sound for for those guys and so charlie's in those little movies and and he kind of revolved around where i came through life and finally got to meet Charlie um in 2022 and um I was I helped mer his merchandise at the convention at spa oh so fantastic Charlie, yeah he walks down this I was thinking of this today when I knew I was going to talk to you he walks down you know they, they call me and ask if I would um vend my merchandise and handle Charlie's and I said well yeah sure be great but he walks down with this little cardboard box full of his cds you know, it nothing fancy oh. at all. <laughs> right. A little cardboard box, and he, yeah, Miss Nedred, so nice to meet you. <laughs> and um, then he would be at the booth, and I got to spend time, a lot of time, with him telling his stories, which are, you know, amazing too. These lifetimes of achievement and a lifetime of opportunities to where they met people that that are gone, right? That are major legends, you know, in the field that they studied under. And then we come up like, oh, you know, I get to <laughs> right. get in their presence, you know, and uh, bask in that. And so for that, I'm grateful this little Northern California girl decided to finally quit. Um, I worked for a large corporation and I just I kind of 
ended up not there anymore. And I just completely threw myself into studying and learning and driving and meeting and doing and interviewing and um, changing my life all because of this little harmonica, right? Well, that's that's fantastic. I appreciate every everything you do. And I think, I think like you were talking before, like my book brings a lot of light to how hard it was for those musicians to to make a living in, in the in the trials and tribulations they had on the road. And um, you know, everybody sees them on stage and see and thinks like what a great lifestyle, you know, but they don't see what goes what goes on the other 22 hours of the day. So I, I think I you know and one of the one of the uh one of the things that came out of the book was just how hard hard these guys work and and what it takes to to make it as a musician and how much they they love the genre to put up with everything they do to make it to, to put out the great music that that we hear day in and day out from these, these yeah great exactly I, you know and you were you talk about where it's going and, and things and we've got like jason ritchie who you know i jason's jason oh my god right. <laughs> just jason and he's phenomenal but he's out there and he talks about the tribulations you know if you follow him he just lost right. a mm-hmm. member of his band and how hard that is and and the day in and the day out grind of it and he's doing it with with his wife which is pretty cool she's amazing i've seen them live and um if you when you're in their presence and they're playing live and they're in their that's their glory but then afterwards you know there's things like food poisoning <laughs> <You Right. know? laughs> Driving all night to the next gig and in a, all that in a, stuff, so. in a little teeny yeah. van that needs right. transmission. I mean, so a lot of the same tribulations still still go on in in that when you when you dedicate that's your life. You're dedicating everything to it, and um, fortunately, he he shares so much. I, I did sit on in on his seminar where he talked about some of his innovation on the, on the harmonica. And then when I read your book, I went over back into David Barrett's. He's David has his um, bluesharmonica.com and he has a whole uh, video section on William Clark. And um, so you can he talks about how he had just composed uh, the the letter to get him to come to a master class. And then. Oh, wow. Yeah. So oh. we. Yeah, you know, we, he would have been there, uh, which we had to be would have been great. I, you know, and that's after I was starting to go, so I, I would have right. had the opportunity to uh, see him. But listening to his licks and looking at, you know, David transcribes everything he puts. He, it's a great resource, everybody out there for blues. Period is David Barrett is hands down the best online for blues because he. He's put everything into it and he transcribes things. So he has the lonesome. Um, let me see. I've got the PDF here. He's he's no, that's a different one. He has he has it all transcribed. Here it is. Yeah, he's got the lonesome bedroom blues. And what I found super amazing is how he takes it up to that five blow, like in an unexpected place. And mm-hmm. it sounds so good. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, how did he yeah. how did he know to do that? <laughs> you know? Well, I, I think I think one thing Bill Clark um, and I, I know I mentioned the book and it's one thing that he he talked to me about, too, when he was helping me learn is that, you know, listen to other instruments. Um, it, it's OK to, you know, copy little Walter or big Walter, that kind of thing. Obviously, when you start out, you want to you want to focus in on the masters and learn learn their licks. But then you want to go off and you want to you want to uh, come up with your own sound. And he certainly did that. You know, he listened to a lot of saxophone players and he loved B3 organ players like Jimmy McGriff and uh, Groove Holmes and, and brother Jack McDuff. So he, he was always listening to others. And, 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 and some of the guys that toured with him told me that later in life, you know, in the van, or oh, the van, he was always listening to, you know, see or not CDs at that time, more like cassette tapes and that type of thing. But he won't he won't listen to other hard players. He would listen to, you know, jazz players and and you know to, to come up with his own ideas to, to um to incorporate into his, his harmonica playing. So he was such an original player and had such original ideas. I think that's something that I certainly learned from and tried tried to get better at. And I think everybody else 
it, it's a it's a good lesson too. I think there's a lot of things in the book that if we could take the what his philosophy was in playing and incorporate it into our own play. And I think we'll, we'll become better players. Well, it must be another baby called Jane. Don't shake like that Well, that must be jelly, baby Cause damn, don't shake like that Well, I love my baby Cause dollars so big and fat Put my arms around you, baby Let me know I'm in love with you Put my arms around you, baby Let me know I'm in love with you Jimmy Jam is going to make it, make it all right with you.
yeah, and that is how you swing. And you love that jelly baby and that bacon fat. That old good eating, I'll tell you what, and good blues music right there. Now, I purchased that off of iTunes, and you can find a whole collection of William Clark out there and uh, worth the money. So go ahead and uh, buy yourself a few tracks out there. This next one was um, Hawaiian Eyes Mix. It's sent by Paul, and it also includes Mitch Kashmir. So uh, there's some wonderful players here on this love story that we're telling you today about William Clark and Blowing Like Hill. Enjoy the song. That's some more swinging right there, I'll tell you what. This next one, What Did I Do So Wrong, is also one from Paul Barry, the author of this fabulous book. Um, Enjoy, and then we've got some more discussions before we wrap up this podcast. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Down on me, baby 
Definitely, definitely. It is a great read for um, for anyone that is aspiring to be and trying to learn and dedicated to the instrument. It shows his full dedication all the way through. And um, it, it's wonderful. Um, it's sad because it's not it's sad and it's not sad because he he did get to play once he sobered up. He did. Right. He experienced the zenness of how great he was. I mean, he got to see sober um, how great he was. And yeah, he did that, and that's that's one of the things. When I when I wrote the book, I didn't I didn't realize the extent that alcohol controlled controlled his life. I I lived with him in 1985 in California, and he he quit his day job in '87 to become a full time musician, and that's where the alcohol abuse escalated. So I didn't realize to the extent that it developed until I started working on the book and talking to some of his bandmates and his wife, Jeanette and things like that. But it, it was so great for me and so inspiring that he was able to give up alcohol and at least like you said, live, live the last seven, eight months of his life alcohol free. And, and he was playing better than ever and, and feeling really great and, and knowing that he could go on stage without that crutch of alcohol and, and, and be a great player. And, people accepted him for that they 
and and he was just so elated and just playing so well. It just uh, just tragic that it ended too soon. Definitely, it, alcohol takes its toll. It's and it's it's highly addictive, and there's other things. But uh, my husband's brother, uh, John, played with Albert Collins. He toured. He played a Hammond organ. He was a blues. Oh wow! Player. And um, I did get to meet him, but he he was similar in. He was different when he drank. He felt he was very shy and he didn't talk. And then when he would drink, he was the life of the party and he was up mm -hmm. on stage. And by the time he came home from touring with with them, he his alcohol had almost killed him. But he quit and got 10 more years. But it eventually, you know, it, it got to his body. So it, that part of the book was really hard for um, Julio to read. Oh, I kind of said and and. I think the same thing can be can be true of uh, Bill and maybe a lot of other musicians. Is uh, I know I know Bill was a shy person, and I mean he was such a a, a big man, six two, and you know nice nice sturdy build. But uh, you know behind the scenes, off stage, he was a shy shy person. I think the alcohol helped him get on stage, and, and I think that's one reason he wore the sunglasses too. And and Charlie Musselwhite told me he was the same way before he had given up alcohol too. He needed that extra boost of alcohol to get on stage and perform. And, uh, and I, I think a lot of musicians I talked to in the course of doing the book had, had run into problems with themselves with, with alcohol or drug abuse. So I think it's, it's not uncommon in, in, in that industry. And it's, uh, you know, it's wonderful when they, when the musicians can give it up and realize that there's, there's more to life than that. And, uh, and some can't and some, some can, but it's, it's definitely, definitely a, a pitfall of the business I think oh 100 percent and you know in a lot of people they just they need an extra uh crutch to get through it it is scary to get up on stage in front yeah. of people and you know and all of a sudden you're looking out and I'll tell you for me the scariest it was for me was playing for at David Barrett's class master class concerts because it was all the pros watching you. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Same at spa, you know, you're like, well, they know what they're yeah. doing. They're gonna notice if I mess up. But uh I got I got over it and I I love the, to play for people. It's it's wonderful. It's very um it's very wonderful. And you know, I I believe the harmonica is the one instrument that can hit a person in the gut with feeling more than any right. other instrument. So you've I got a big so task too. up there. Right. Right. You're not only going to make them feel good, but you're going to make them think and, and really, really feel. And that's I think that's the goal with harmonica players. You know, I, I we feel it and we want other people to feel feel the feeling of the harmonica. And um, I I love it. And, and, you know, I didn't even realize in my life that I was listening. Everything I bought and listened to throughout my whole life always had a horn section or harmonica in it and right. I was unaware that I I just really liked it so much and nowadays you know there's all kinds of um ways to learn I know that Horner has uh set up different programs where you can go in and get um backing tracks to slow down slow downers and just right you know a lot a lot more but I still think it takes the dedication and the drive or you're just going to put it down yeah exactly right now i think you just have to have that drive to to get better and i know i know bill always had trouble accepting accolades from people um on you know how good he was you're great and and he always had trouble that with that i think that's because he, he always aspired to get better and better and i've noticed that with a lot of musician friends that i am friends with they might sound great to you but in their eyes it's like I can get better. You know, I'm going to keep working and get better. And that's what Bill wanted to do. He always wanted to move his music forward and, and keep advancing it and not, not rest on his laurels. And so I, I, think, I know that, I mean, what an honor that you've done this for him and brought it to us. And I, I really dig the t-shirt, everybody. You got to go to his website and order the t-shirt. It's, it's a very nice, nice t-shirt. And the book is great. And just your music as well. You you're doing um you do a yearly um New Year's Eve party with some pretty great players and you got a lot going on yourself there. So Yeah, we do, Nedra. I started booking some 
booking some people way back in the late late 70s. Um, I brought Big Walter Horton up here and Eddie Taylor and Sunnyland Slim and um, Big Smokey Smothers. So I've, I've always had my hand in it just because I wanted to see these players and they weren't coming up here. So I kind of always always want to uh, reach out and bring bring them up here. So I, I, I've continued to do that. We I have an, um, an, a yearly New Year's Eve event with my buddy, Harold Tremblay, and we bring up uh, Fed Sugar Ray Norcia and, and Johnny Bergen and Tad Robinson and Anson Funderburg. So every year we, Billy Flynn, people like that, we try to bring up uh, a few performers each year just to bring in the new year in style with some good blues. That's really awesome. So what um you do you play um you play diatonic and chromatic yourself? I do. Yes, I do. And um luck, lucky enough, uh Bill Clark showed me how to play chromatic. So I um kind of that that West Coast sound that I talked about in the book that originated with George Smith playing those big octaves that he kind of mastered. And uh, a lot of people consider George the king of the chromatic, and I, I certainly do as well, too. And a lot of that chromatic sound comes from George Smith and you know, Rod Piazza has that sound, Mark Hummel, Rick Estrin, of course, Bill, Kim Wilson, Mitch Cashmar. So I was lucky to be able to get, get uh, learn that from Bill. So I, I do play chromatic as well as diatonic harmonica too. Well, you know, at one of the master classes I went to, um, Rod Piazza was there and they would do a, they would, he would do a Sunday morning where he had a answer. Um, he'd have three or four masters up there and he had Rod Piazza and Dennis Grohling. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah. And, and David was there. And then, yeah. Um, but it was so funny because Dennis Grueling wanted to learn under Rod so bad. And he would go over and he'd go over and Rod would be in his garage, he said, and, and Honey'd be in there. And then he'd be like, he'd try to talk to him and he'd just kind of, eh, whatever, you know, and yeah. leave CDs. And he, I mean, he probably got a million of them, right? You know, so. Right whatever and then um honey said you really need to listen to this kid and that's how they and because of her then he did and then he took him in and and started working with him which oh know. that's that's wonderful and I, yeah. I think i think george would be happy because he passed that on to bill and rod and uh a lot of players like that and bill bill passed it on to me and hopefully i'm passing it on other people so i think that's the whole goal is to share what you can with other 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 players. I know um, David Barrett's a great teacher, and Ronnie Shellist, and um, you know we have a lot of great. You know, uh, Jason's a great teacher, so it's a lot a lot of great resources out there where people are sharing what they know. Um, back in the day when I started learning, people were a little bit guarded with what they were what they were teaching people. So now it just seems like there's a lot more um, information that's being shared among players, which is, which is really wonderful. It is, but you know, it also takes that determination then to go and start getting your chops with bands and other players and right. in the music end, you know, and, and things like that. So there's, there's a lot to it. And um, I, I, what I'm seeing kind of happening um myself when i'm looking out there there's a lot of americana type stuff um reviving with the younger kids so they're starting to 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 jump into older stuff you know the piedmont blues and having the fiddle and having you know the whole uh jug banny thing kind of like reviving a little bit you know and a lot of people started there too as well you know yeah it, yeah it, it, it's great to, it's great to see that and like i said it just takes that dedication where if you want to learn something bad enough and bill's a good example like that you'll learn it you know you'll 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 spend the time you'll seek out the resources and it, it's great a lot of younger younger people are coming into it they might not have the knowledge to know who muddy waters is or willie dixon or little walter but when they hear the music they can relate to it so it's something that maybe attracts them to learning more like we did as we started out. You know, we'd hear from the Rolling Stones were playing a song and then we'd want to go back further and where'd they get that song from? And then once you heard Willie Dixon or Holland Wolf or Sonny Boy Williamson playing it, um, you kind of push those guys aside and start going after the real thing. So that yeah. that's kind of the hope that we can, some of the younger players will kind of, will kind of dive into uh, what, what we did as we were learning. Now, um, have you ever gone to the spa conventions, the Society for the Advancement? I was there last year, as a matter of fact. I did a seminar on on William Clark. 
Oh, darn. I was there. In uh, St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah, I was there. I, I mapped myself out because I usually go to give a seminar, to perform, or just to vend. But this year, um, I went by myself just to hang out and go to all the oh, seminars fun. things. It, it there, was there, really there's fun. So much, there's so much to hear. It's hard to pick what, what seminar to go to. But. Exactly. I, I went and saw Dave Moore um, on the songwriting. I was, oh my gosh, i so impressed. You're just in awe. And um, yeah, so that's a great resource if you can. Of course, it's expensive to go and stay a week somewhere, especially on this coast to that coast. But uh, we I've been fortunate. We've done done it quite a bit. And um, the thing that you learn there is there's so many types of playing and there's so many players. Yeah. There's great players that that nobody knows about, you know, and they just play. They play at their local bar, but but they're bringing it forward so that people understand that the harmonica is a real thing. Yeah. So, and, it, and like yeah. you said, there's so many different forms. I, you know, there's great jazz players and country players and players that play Irish music. And it just, it's just amazing the great music you can get through the harmonica, you know, outside of blues, there's other great forms and you, you hear it all at spa, like you said. So that's, that's a, a fun place to go, even if you're not an accomplished player, just to go and, and pick up some tips or listen, you know, to the great players. Wow. I want to thank Paul for sending me the book and also taking the time to talk to me here. Um, great, great book, really good read. He's written, it's well written. It's a love story. Um, William Clark and his wife, Jeanette fell in love with the blues and dedicated their life and sacrificed a whole lot to bring his sound forward. And, um, He's one of the great, great players, and everyone that's written a little little footnote in here are all great, great blues players in their own right, and they all leave a little love note as well um, to him. So thank you uh, so much, Paul, for writing such a great book and taking time and moving it forward. And like I told everybody, you go to his website. I've got it here, a link below on this, and you can get the T-shirt and the book and find out what's going on and see if 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 Paul makes it to spa this year, you know, which would be great. Uh, find him down probably in the vending area, one of my favorite spots. And uh, check that out. So keep your eyes open or order your copy if you don't have, get to go to spa and actually meet him, you know, buy the book online. Charlie Muscle write, writes in the back of the book, he says, William Clark should be remembered as one of the great blues players. He was always reaching and always following his own path. He was a true blues man. He understood the feeling, the spirit, and he lived it. And um, boy, I tell you, he did. And I'm so grateful to have this kind of missing link to a puzzle of my own study of um, the West Coast sound. You know, living here in California, I, I know our sound from Sacramento and the Bay Area, but I didn't understand the rich history down there in Southern California. And now I kind of want to go. I know that our legendary Rod Piazza plays down there sometimes, and uh, you can still catch the scene down there. It sounds like it's pretty good. I'm going to have to make myself a little trip down and check that whole thing out. I'm going to close this um, podcast with a song by William Clark. Clark called Let's Celebrate Life. And it's about him loving his life and playing with his friends. And I don't know about you, but it's awful fun to get out there and play with your friends and go to live blues shows and uh, keep the blues alive, as well as live entertainment and supporting the harmonica interests of the world. And uh, over and out from the harmonica lady until next time. Bye bye. Yes, I want to rob and stop and blow my blues away I've been working so hard and now's my time to play I got the stereo on and all them drinks so nice Where the stereo's on, I got those drinks so nice Fried chicken and big, baby, ain't that nice Let's celebrate life and baby have some fun Let's celebrate life and baby have some fun I'm on the wrong 
just like the fire from past past one Yeah, yeah, he was welcome in my home Yeah, yeah, I can't do it all alone I'm gonna call my friends right here on my little telephone Till half past one 